My name is Doug Levesque, and I'm the former pastor of this church. Started this church and pastored for 20 years, and uh, was a King James man. And when I started, I thought there was a whole bunch of King James men, and in, in the course of 20 years, I found that there were less and less. And um, so with our Bible Nation Society, we decided to honor the King James Bible, the 400th anniversary of it, in Washington, D.C., and we were able to put on this wonderful uh, demonstration. We had tons of media, did interviews with anybody who's anybody about this national icon, the King James Bible, and how it formulated our language. And Brother Stringer and Brother Sorensen came and spoke at George Washington University, and we had a display on the, on the lawn of the Capitol building, and it was, um, it was a wonderful, we distributed 30, 40,000 John and Romans, so it, it was just Brother um, Osteen was there, and uh, so it was, a, it was a grand day. We did not set out to be a King James organization, but we did that. And the, it was a great event. On those days, those three days we were there, were the same days that um, Osama bin Laden was found and killed. And so that took a three-day news meet, uh, cycle and took all, all of our media interviews away. We had interviewed with everybody, ABC, NBC. Uh, everybody was kind of interested in that. But we still had a lot that came from that. And uh, the residual, I think, was the formation of the King James Bible Research Council. And so for years, we've had a wonderful website, articles being pushed, uh, annual meeting, and then, of course, sub-meetings because all the, the uh, variant speakers are publishing books and speaking on the King James Bible. So we've had a good residual effect from that. We love King James Bible advocates. There's a lot of different types of King James Bible advocates, right? There's some flaming people that are jumping off buildings with King James Bible, you know, sheets, you know, or something. And then there's people that just say, well, you know, I'm not really sure about everything, but I think I'm uh, probably King James, or I just appreciate the King James. And so we've tried to be broad in our appreciation for those people to bring them together so that we can constantly discuss the issues that are at hand. And so every year we get together, and there's always a new thing. Brethren, there's always a new thing. Every year there's a new thing. And it's really not a new thing, it's an old thing. And we come back with some textual arguments or we, we deal with those things. So appreciate you men very much. I prayed this morning and said, these are, my these are my best friends in the world. I don't get to spend a lot of time with them. But we're of the same mind and heart about the word of God. And, of course, one of my favorite things is that display over there. Uh, there used to be several people doing stuff like that. But that's one of the last living, moving uh, displays. And um, Brother Brown's going to auction that off a little bit later today. And so... We'll see who's got enough money for that. Okay, just kidding. Well, it seems to me why we don't always set a theme every year for our events, that there, there does kind of de facto become a thematic uh, issue. And it's usually maybe the latest philosophy or the latest theory. And, um, and we always kind of address it, sometimes with some of the same old issues, but more and more I think we've been trying to address it differently. This time we have a... Uh, another room over there where we're addressing in 20-minute uh, sessions, uh, I guess one of the terms that was used in sort of a TED Talk fashion where people can ask questions afterwards, the different issues as well. So we'll see how that does online. But we always have thousands of people watch these and then show interest in the different videos. So praise God for modernity. People might not work as hard at getting into Michigan in November to a meeting, but they are, they are watching it, and, and it's good to have you guys here today. Well, uh, this year I think you're going to hear a lot mentioned about this new book. It's, uh, we're not selling it. Uh, we're kind of talking a lot about the language of the Bible and the so-called archaisms. This is a book by Mark Ward. It's called Authorize, the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. And, of course, it's an indictment. And uh, he was a um, uh, Bob Jones graduate. He worked with Bob Jones Press. And, uh, of course, when you're dealing with the press, you're dealing with people wanting different versions. And so in dealing with that, he kind of formulated some stuff that wasn't happy to King James uh, Bible. And so um, this uh, book really indicts the concept of who authorized what, what's so authorized about it. And it really becomes indicting. And I don't know how much I'll go back to you about that, except that when he gets to the meat of his argument, as everyone is this year, when they're arguing about the, the uh, language of the King James Bible, he talks about the Trinitarian Bible Society, TBS, a major promoter of contemporary use of King James Bible, 
not so much, I don't think, but a little bit, even lists some of these dead words. An article found on the website says, we acknowledge that some of the words in the King James have changed their meaning over the centuries. Tro, bray, unicorn, champagne, pate, leasing, brute, collop, durst, emrod. So they're listing these words. There's 10 of them. It's not that really many, you know, a lot of those words. I mean, I could say 10 words right now. Ohio State trumped Michigan in football and knocked them out of the national championship race. How's that? How's that? So that's not a lot of words. It's not hard to understand. These are just a few words. But notice that the TBS confuses two categories of words here. Those that, quote, have changed their meaning and those that have simply died out, words that are no longer used. And he says, I see only one word in their list, in fact, whose meaning has changed. So they're making the statement, which is disingenuous of them, but he's utilizing their own words. And he says, it's the word unicorn. I'm sure every English speaker knows what the word means today. A magical white horse with a single horn protruding from the center of its head. And then he goes on to kind of do a little bit more mocking of that um, particular word unicorn. So I knew this was the rage. A lot of the millennials are thinking about this. And of course, this book doesn't even touch the text issues. It just texts the antiquated words, uh, language of the King James Bible. It doesn't even text it. So they say that we're unreasonable, and yet they're not being reasonable because they're not even touching the text issue. They've kind of even left that. Apparently we've won that, and now they just are going to talk about how old we are, I guess. I don't know. So then I uh, found this article on the, on the um, Internet, Seven Things You May Not Know About the King James Bible. And it's kind of a gotcha piece. Bet you didn't know this about the King James Bible, mocking King James advocates. In fact, she says, these, uh, the stance of these Christians has been referred to as King James onlyism. I want you to know, I've been in this fight as long as anybody, and as prominently, and as loud, and I've never called it King James onlyism. And I don't know a whole lot of people that do, except our enemies call it King James onlyism. And it's not that we're against the previous Bibles that were used up until that point, because not, we're not King James only in that sense. And um, so uh, I'm not King James only in the sense of the Bible being translated into other languages. So it's a disingenuous uh, account. So I thought, okay, interesting. Article on the, uh, on the language of the King James Bible. The King James uses many archaic words, words such as jangling, subtle, privily, and hopin. Four real difficult words there. And it uses archaic expressions and phrases that are unfamiliar to modern readers. For instance, how many people readily understand charity vaunteth not itself? So already I'm like, oh my word. But this is a prominent website uh, in Australia. Um, furthermore, the edition of the King James Bible that is still commonly used contains several words that have changed in meaning over time, such as flowers, suffer, vile, conversation, and quit convey different meanings to modern readers. Not that difficult. You're indicting the King James Bible, but you're, you're really not. I mean, you're, you're coming out with kids' gloves. Come on. Um, the fact, in the next paragraph, the fact that the KJV uses the word unicorn nine times and satyr twice is also problematic as unicorns and satyrs are regarded as mythical, mythical creatures rather than real animals, wild oxen, and goats that are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible in a more contemporary translations. And so she goes on to talk about that. And here are the seven things that you didn't know about the King James Bible, this, this thing that is such tr so troublesome. He says that his pastor, Mark Minnick, who was a Bob Jones uh, New Testament instructor, uh, and, he, and, and he quotes him in there saying that the King James Bible is, is um, I'm going to read it to you, exact words, an impediment to Bible teaching. The KJV is an impediment to Bible teaching. So here's the gotcha. The, number one, the KJV was not the first English translation. Ooh. We're not making that claim. I mean, that's, that's a, number two, the KJV has been through several editions. Ooh, right? 1611, 1769, couple in between there. Spelling, punctuation, removing the Latinisms. That's it. Number three, King James authorized the new Bible translation for political reasons. Ooh, right? I mean, I think Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah to Israel for political reasons. So God can use political reasons to get his work done. 
Number four, the translators of the KJV 1611 were untrained in Koine Greek. I don't think this is really true, but she said that most of the Koine was discovered in the 1800s and 1900s when tens of thousands of papyrus documents were discovered, by the way, which were majority texts, which were traditional texts, um, as Brother Sorensen likes to say. And she said, only then could we understand the language more um, fully at that point in time. Kind of a spurious argument. Number five, the King James tri uh, KJV translation of the New Testament is based on relatively recent Greek manuscripts. Well, there's another book back there by Brother Sorensen that you can get, nice black hardback book. We're talking about oldest is not always best. You know the arguments about that. Number six, the Textus Receptus or received text is basically the Erasmus Greek text. Ooh. <laughs> Man, you're not even throwing darts, you're throwing flowers. What, what, you know, that's not, hardly an indictment. So the millennial group now, the arguments, are not even textual arguments this year. They're, they're pansy art, art, uh, arguments. So I read this, and it was a big website, compelling article, lots of people reading it, commenting on it. I think there was 52 comments on the comment page, but I said, huh, why does everybody always say unicorns? Unicorns and satyrs, unicorns and satyrs, unicorns and satyrs. That's an argument against the King James Bible, unicorns and satyrs. So I said, okay, so I've, I've come up with some good stuff. This is not me. This is stuff that I've just researched on there. I'm not this good, but I'm just going to read some stuff to you about unicorns and satyrs. Is that okay? I'll do it in a compelling and entertaining way. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. If you look up the word unicorn in the Webster's New World Dictionary, it says unicorn, a mythical horse-like animal with a single horn growing from its forehead. This is what most of us think of when we hear the word unicorn. We think of a horse with a horn growing from its head. This is how unicorns are depicted in movies, cartoons, paintings, etc. Now, this is not a real character. The, this animal is totally fictitious. None of us alive today and no scientist has ever found a fossil of one. However, unicorns are mentioned in the King James Bible, the version of the Bible nine times. By the way, this article is more of a scientific article. It's not a pro-King James Bible article, and you'll get that in some of the readings that I have here. Uh, nine different times, five different books, five different authors. Balaam, Moses, David, Isaiah, and even God in the book of Job. These are the verses that mention unicorns. And he mentions Num uh, Numbers 23, two, 22. God brought them up out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. Numbers 24, eight. God brought them forth out of Egypt. By the way, he's bringing them forth out of Africa, all right? Out of Egypt, he's bringing them forth out of Africa. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Job 39.9, Job 39.10, Psalm 29.6, he maketh them also skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn, Psalm 92.10. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Deuteronomy 33, 17, Psalm 22, 21, Isaiah 34, 7. Unicorns are not mentioned in any of the modern translations. Only in the King James Version are they mentioned. Most of the modern translations say wild ox. Some even say buffalo. However, many Christian apologists are insistent that the King James Version is the most accurate of all the English translations. Yes, that would be us. Thank you. We're Christian apologists. So because of this, some people, especially atheists, like to scoff at the Bible and make fun of it as a book of myths and fairy tales. We shouldn't use that language. It's antiquated. It's making us look stupid to scientists because they, now we're showing that we believe in myths and fairy tales. That's what he's saying. However, it is important to understand that the definition of the word unicorn has changed over time. If you get an old 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, how many of you are familiar, familiar with the old 1828 uh, Noah Webster's Dictionary, which is the very first edition dictionary that Webster came out with about 200 years ago, and look up the word unicorn. It says unicorn, an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. 200 years ago, they had a different understanding and a different definition. They didn't have such a hard time. This 1828 dictionary can be accessed free online. It's not hard to get. Notice how this 200-year-old definition of the word unicorn says absolutely nothing about a horse. It says nothing about a horse-like animal or a mythical animal or a fictitious creature. It says absolutely nothing about mythology whatsoever. But rather, it says that this is a name that is often applied to a rhinoceros. 
Now, anyone who has ever seen a rhinoceros knows that a rhinoceros has two horns, a large one up front and a smaller one behind. So how could a rhinoceros be considered a unicorn? Well, if you look up the word rhinoceros in the same 1828 dictionary, it says a genus of quadrupods of two species, one of which, the unicorn, has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal, when full grown, is said to be 12 foot in length. There is another species with two horns, the bicornis. They are natives of Asia and Africa. According to Noah Webster, back in the early 1800s, it was understood that there were two separate species of rhinoceros, those antiquated people back in 1828. The one-horned species was called the unicorn, and the two-horned species was called the bicornis. Today is understood that there are five species of the rhinoceros, three of which have two horns and two of which have one horn. So basically, if you get a 200-year-old Noah Webster dictionary and look up the word unicorn, it says rhinoceros. And if you look up the word rhinoceros, it says unicorn. That was 200 years ago. The King James was translated 400 years ago in 1611. One does not have to be good at math to figure it out. Today's definition of the word unicorn says absolutely nothing about a rhinoceros, and today's definition of rhinoceros says absolutely nothing about a unicorn. The definitions have changed over time. But it's not hard to figure out what it is. So the definition of unicorn has changed in just the past 200 years from rhinoceros to horse. Then it doesn't make much sense to take a modern definition of the word unicorn and apply it to a 400-year-old translation of the Bible. That's illogical. Let me say it again. So if the definition of unicorn has changed in just the past 200 years from rhinoceros to horse, then it doesn't make much sense to to take a modern definition of the word unicorn and apply it to a 400-year-old translation of the Bible. That's illogical. (laughs) As a matter of fact, even today, the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros is Rhinoceros unicornis. And Dicerus bicornis is the scientific name of the two-horned rhinoceros called the black rhinoceros. Where do you think the scientific names come from? Well, they come from the Latin, right? Unicornis and bicornis are Latin words. That's interesting because if you look up the Psalm 92.10 in the Latin Bible, the Latin word that is being used here is the word unicornis. Rhinoceros, same thing. I won't read Psalm 92.10 in the Latin text because I don't know it, but unicornis is the same Latin word that is being used in the scientific name of the Asian one-horned rhinoceros. If you look up Job 39.9 in the Latin Bible, the word that is being used here is the word rhinoceros. Job 39.9 in the Latin text. So one verse says rhinoceros, and the other verse says unicornis. Rhinoceros, unicornis. Rhinoceros, unicornis. That's what we call it scientifically today. As a matter of fact, out of the nine scripture verses that mention the unicorns, there are five different Latin words that are being used. Rhinoceros, rhinoceratus, rhinocerata, unicornium, and unicornis. They're used interchangeably. These five Latin words are used when the old King James Version of the Bible, I like to say the old King James Version of the Bible, mentions unicorns. So the Latin uses both unicornis and rhinoceratus. The original printing of the King James Bible has this on the front, newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special commandment. King James was translated from the original tongues, but the translators also compared their work to former translations, including the Latin. They would have known that the Latin said rhinoceros and they put unicorn. This is evidence that the unicorn meant rhinoceros back in 1611, just like it did in 1828. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 34, 7, in the original printing of the KJV, so we might want to look over here at this to verify this, when the word unicorn is used, there is a footnote that says, or rhinoceros. So somebody write that down and check that out. There's a book that was published in 2003 called The Return of the Unicorns, The Natural History and Conservation of the Great One-Horned Rhinoceros. On the front of this cover, there is a picture of some rhinoceroses, and yet the title is The Return of the Unicorns. If you saw the Drudge Report news report about three days ago, they had a picture that was from this book of this ancient African rhinoceros with one giant horn that looks like a unicorn, and they've actually found several skeletons now. So what we're talking about, science is actually now finding, and putting it to that, and there was an article just about three days ago uh, that you could look up 
in the archives there on Drudge Report. Scientists often say, scientists often use the word unicorn when referring to either the Asian one-horned rhinoceros or the Javan rhinoceros. If you do any research online, you'll find scientists often calling them unicorns. So in other words, it's not an unreasonable, uh, mythical thing that we need to worry about. The Asian one-horned rhinoceros is also, called, is also called the Indian rhinoceros and also as the great one-horned rhinoceros. This is an extinct species of the giant one-horned rhinoceros called, won't say the word, also known as the bighorn rhinoceros. Uh, scientists often refer to this creature, basically an extinct creature, as the giant unicorn. There's fossils of this creature. It might have existed back in Moses' day, in Job's day. As a matter of fact, this is the creature that some creation scientists at, at Answers in Genesis believe is the unicorn of the Bible. So get this, why do some of the Latin words say rhinoceros when some of them say unicornus? In Psalm 92.10, according to the context of Scripture, it's talking about a one-horned animal. Psalm 92.10 says, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Notice how this verse uses phrases like my horn and the horn. That's why the Latin Vulgate says unicornus, because it's talking about a one-horned animal. However, Deuteronomy 33.17, this is Moses, it's talking about a two-horned animal. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns, plural, of unicorns. With him he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, they are the thousands of Manasseh. The large horn is Ephraim, the small horn is Manasseh. So here it's not talking about a mythical beast, it's talking about a rhinoceros. It's using the word here, horns, plural, to show that we're talking about Jace, Jacob got a double blessing, and together the horns are going to push the people. It's magnificent, isn't it? It's beautiful, it's magnificent, it's, it's beautiful language. Um, Moses is speaking here about Joseph and saying that Joseph's two horns are his two sons. Ephraim and Manasseh are Joseph's two sons. You see in the King James Version when it uses the word unicorns, plural, there is a marginal note which says that it's the Hebrew text that actually says unicorn. Stay with me. In the Hebrew text, the word that's being translated as unicorn, rem, in it, is in its singular form. But the word that is being translated as horns, carne, is actually a plural possessive. So the original Hebrew text, he says, is saying that these plural horns are being possessed by this singular unicorn, which means that it's uh, not actually a unicorn, but it's a rhinoceros too. That's why the verse in Latin doesn't say unicornus, because it says rhinoceros, because it's talking about the 200 rhinoceros. He would be indicting, in that particular statement, our King James Bible. But stay with me. Deuteronomy 33.17 says in the Latin, and I won't read it to you. This makes perfect sense because back in Genesis 48, Jacob prophesied that Ephraim would be greater than Manasseh. And I explained that to you. Um, let me skip some of this here. So he says this. So it is true that some early translations of the Bible have a mistranslation. No. This is his scientific, non-King James advocacy mind. They should have written rhinoceroses. Um, early translators, uh, the reason for this may be because the people who were translating this particular verse, now this is great, the reason for this may be because the people who were translating this particular verse that the Latin Vulgate translated the Hebrew word rem as unicornus in a number of places and therefore assumed that it is str strictly talking about a one-horned animal. And when they saw that the verse uses the word horns in the plural, they decided that in order to fit the context, they would translate the singular Hebrew word reem as the plural English word unicorns. However, the singular noun should not have been translated as a plural. This is according to him. But then he goes to contradict himself, supporting us. There are times when the singular Hebrew nouns must be translated as English, plural English nouns and times when plural Hebrew nouns must be translated as singular English nouns. However, these instances have a grammatical basis and not just based on context alone. For instance, in Genesis 1-1, when it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the Hebrew word for God here is Elohim, which literally means God's plural. So why is this verse not translated into English as God's created the heaven and the earth? After all, in chapter 2, the same word is translated God's, plural. 
The reason is because there is a Hebrew verb bara, which means he created. Since this verb is identifying Elohim as a singular, it must be understood as a singular and therefore translated as such, regardless of the fact that Elohim is in the plural form. This is known as the constructio ad sensum, which is Latin for grammatical structure. However, in Deuteronomy 33, 17, there is no grammatical basis for the singular noun reum to be translated as the plural noun unicorn. Singulars cannot be translated as plurals, plurals just based on context alone without grammatical reason for doing so. So basically, the Hebrew rules of grammar and therefore of translation were properly practiced by the King James translators when they translated not just Elohim, but unicorns in the way that they translate in plural and singular. The reason modern translations say wild ox is because Hebrew scholars today believe that Ram is a type of wild bull, although they are not completely certain of its exact identity. Therefore, modern translators translate it wild ox. We don't really, we're not sure about this. The translators weren't sure about this, so they put this. And we're not sure about this, so we're going to put something else that we're not sure about. Oh, it's funny almost if it wasn't so sad. However, Psalm 92.10 is very clear, saying that this animal has one horn, while Deuteronomy 33.17 is clearly saying that it has two horns. Therefore, whatever the ram is, it must be an animal that could have either one or two horns, not a wild ox, right? Rhinoceros fits that picture. There is a one-horned rhinoceros and a two-horned rhinoceros. And rhinos are often called bulls. If you ever watch a TV special on Animal Planet or Discovery, you'll find that scientists often refer to an adult male rhinoceros as a bull. Therefore, the rhinoceros fits that picture. Wild ox does not. As a matter of fact, there is no such thing as a wild ox. The definition of an ox is a domesticated bull. Therefore, the term wild ox literally means a wild domesticated bull. This is an oxymoron. If a bull is wild, then it's not domesticated. If it's domesticated, then it's not wild. It's kind of like saying salty fresh water. If it's salty, then it's not fresh. If it's fresh water, it's not salty. There's no such thing as a wild ox. So they've taken our mythology that we've proven is not a mythology and is real, and they've put in there mythology. Wow! <laughs> oh. And then he says, early translators from Tyndale on may have caused us confusion. Now, why did they may have caused us confusion? Because they, they were just translating what was there. Whether they understand it or not, they translated it correctly. And he says, but at least they got it more or less right. Not a King James advocate defending by science the King James Bible and its translation. Amen? So everybody says, oh, the language, oh, the antiquity, oh, the unicorns. And yet, their response is even more foolish, professing them fel- themselves to be wise, right? Well, what about satyrs? That's the other complaint. Satyrs, the word translated as satyr, is the Hebrew word seir, Strong's 8163. It has several meanings, including hairy. Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, Genesis 27, 11. Now, Maybe we could say Esau is a satyr. We'll get to that, but this is what they translate here. Uh, it's translated goat. Lay his hand upon the head of the goat. Leviticus 24, 424. Devils. They shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Leviticus 17, 7. Satyrs. And satyrs shall dance there. Isaiah 13, 21. Rough. The rough goat is the king of Grecia. Daniel 8, 21. So each of these situations is referencing something in particular, and that particular thing is not a positive thing. It's a hellish thing in this word, Seder. So the word Seder is found twice in the King James Bible. Inscription, the Seder seems to be a hairy goat or devil or demon, and it is portrayed as a really spiritual entity and not as a mythological creature. Uh, Isaiah 13. 1321, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and the owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Isaiah, thir- th- Isaiah 34, 14, the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts on the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Not only does the King James Bible use the word satyr in the Isaiah passages, but so also do the following versions. The Geneva Bible, Calvin's 
uh, Latin translation, the English Revised Version of 1881. So it's wrong to use unless it's the English Revised Version of 1881, and then it's okay, right? Webster's 1833 translation, the Revised Standard Version, 1952, the Jewish Publication Society 1917 translation, uh, the Hebrew Publishing Company of New York Version 1936, the Jerusalem Bible 1968, the New American Bible 1970, the New Jerusalem Bible 1985, the recent Judaica Press Tanakh Jewish translation, Lamsus 1936 translation of the Syriac Peshitta, the Greek Septuagint, the KJV 21st century, and the Third Millennium Bible. In other words, Bibles before and after have used unicorn and Seder. Regardless of what they say, Regardless of when you think this Greek translation, talking about the Greek Septuagint now, of the Old Testament was made or by whom, this, chuck, this version is chock full of satyrs, devils, dragons, and unicorns. It goes on to talk about where those words are found. Satyrs are mentioned four times in the Greek Septuagint. Satyrs shall dwell in it, devils shall dance there, and satyrs shall dwell, devils shall meet with satyrs, there shall the satyrs rest. There's a concept being translated. The Revised Standard Version of 19... 52, Leviticus 17, 7, so they shall say no more, slay their sacrifices for satyrs. So modern translators who are using this argument are not looking at their own versions that they're championing. They're saying that our Bible's anti antiquated because it uses satyr, but so does theirs. The New American Standard Version, 2 Chronicles 11, 5, he set up priests of his own for the high places, for the satyrs and for the calves which he had made. That's a place that isn't, it's not used in the King James Bible. So even among the various other modern versions, there is little agreement on how to translate this term. What we see in the various versions is a wide variety of translations that include all kinds of different words. Now, is there a place in the Bible where an animal is possessed of a devil? Pigs. Pigs are possessed of devils, and then they act in devilish ways, right? So this concept of a, of a satyr being a hairy, shaggy, goat-like character, but also being uh, tied to a devilish incarnation or a possession, it would fit with Jacob talking about his brother, <laughs> amen? It, would, it might fit with priests that weren't supposed to be priests. So it's not a mythological concept at all. It's a concept that very much makes sense, was translated in the Latin, was in the uh, Greek Septuagint that the King James translators definitely would have had. And these 56 men would have taken multiple years. And what did you say, 15 uh, times going over the translation. And in these several places, they translated it as satyrs. So the accusation, particularly with the word Seder, that we have an antiquated Bible, we could point right back at them and say, you do too, because you use the word Seder. Now, I've tried to very quickly deal with the concept that is in this, which is, this is all the buzz, authorized the use and misuse of the scripture. When he gets down to the meat of it, the main throw that he blows is antiquated language, unicorns and Seders. That's that's the thrust of the rest of his proposition. This is why we need contemporary Bibles. After all, people don't get together and say, what's old? They get together and say, what's new? And everybody wants something new. And so, in fact, he even says that in his class, his Bible instructor, his thesis instructor said, if you want a Textus Receptus Bible, then go ahead and give us a new contemporary version of it. Now, I don't know what kind of thinking that is. But that's not a reasonable argument against the King James Bible, especially if you're going to throw the text issues out. But if millennials want to skip that and then say the language is antiquated, we want something new, we want something new, we want something new. It's kind of like the men of Sodom. Send out something new. We want whatever went in your house is what we want. And that's the age that we live in. What did those men of Sodom want, the age of Sodom want? They wanted strange flesh. And it's interesting, that first article that I read to you, I got to looking at that website and looking who wrote that book. Why are you, why are you using the same language that I've been fighting for decades? Why are you using this? Where did you get it from? What is your purpose in not wanting the King James Bible? Found out it was a female pastor, a female author who is leading the feminist movement in Australia so that they could have gender equality. 
Female pastors are just as good as male pastors. Female roles and male roles in family, in society, in ministry are equal. And she is the champion of this thing. And she even has articles on gender-inclusive language Bibles. So why all of a sudden, as we are rolling into the season of Sodom and Gomorrah, where everybody wants something new, we've got a whole new set, fresh set of enemies using same old arguments, but not using text arguments, using antiquated language arguments that we easily refute in just a few minutes, in just a few uh, internet inquiries. And the reason is, I think, ultimately, because of the gender issue. Wikipedia. If it's in Wikipedia, it must be true. Gender in Bible translation concern various issues such as the gender of God and generic antecedents in reference to people. Many, in, in other words, they don't like the male-female pronouns. Many of today's churches have become conscious of and concerned about sexism. Bruce Metzger, our friend from the UBS, states that English language is so biased towards the male gender that it may restrict and obscure meaning from the original languages. Then, listen, that means all the way back there, this was evident. We were, we were busy using other arguments to defend the King James Bible. We couldn't even fathom that this was going to be a God as a woman issue. But yet, that's kind of what it is. English, the New Revised Standard Version, was one of the first major translations to adopt gender-neutral language. The King James Version translated at least one passage using a technique that is many now reject in other translations. In other words, now this article is saying that the King James did this. Not true. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The Greek word is yoi, that appears in the original, is usually translated as sons, but in this passage the translators chose to use the term children. That included both genders. In other words, if you read the preface, the King James translators wanted an easy-to-know language version, and they also were gender-inclusive. They're even redefining the preface. And if it, it wasn't the translators that were the preservers, it was God who was the preserver. And while I appreciate the King James translators and their preface, fooey on their preface, it's not inspired scripture, amen, in that regard. Um, opponents of gender-neutral language moi, believe that readers who are not familiar with the original language can be influenced by a compromised meaning they believe is feminist. <laughs> and that's what I just discovered. It was a website. Hey, seven things you don't know about the King James Bible. I thought, okay, I'm game. Seven things I don't know about the King James Bible. And it was an indictment on things that don't matter. It was an attack on language because ultimately the motivation was gender-neutral language, the feminist mystique, etc. There are two translations that are particularly notable for their efforts to take radical steps in this regard, both explaining their reasons and their techniques in the front matter. The titles of these two translations are similar, but two translations are distinct. The first is the Inclusive New Testament, 1994. The second is the New Testament solves an inclusive version, 1995. The first one deliberately tried to make the text agree with their creed, pointing out that when they saw problems with the message of the text, quote, it becomes our license to introduce Midrash. Midrash is a Jewish perspective of a feminist God into the text. It is an original translation. The second one, however, is based on the NRSV, making changes as the editorial team saw fit, but being less radical to change the message of the original. Gentlemen. I would say that God put these um, little oddities, unicorns and satires, in our language for us as proofs, as discoveries in their day. All of a sudden, this same article comes out in the Drudge Report. All of a sudden, I know Michigan elects its very first lesbian attorney general and the issue is gender inclusivity and the so-called equality. Modernity wants to put its imprint on the Bible no matter what the text. Now we continue with the text issue because that is the issue. But we also have to know 
that millennials are altogether skipping the textual issue for the matter of putting onto the Bible what they want to put on the Bible, but they're falsely using arguments like unicorns and satyrs, and those are things that we can take care of. And all God's people said? Thank you.